Morning, uh, Mareba, and just I just wanted to today follow up from last time we took the service. Last time we looked at the Sermon on the Plain, and today we're looking at the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and or the Beatitudes part of that, which of course is much better known, and I'm sure you're very familiar with it, but I'll share it with you. So, uh, chapter 5 of Matthew. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they were, they were cursed, sorry, per, they were persecuted, the prophets, the prophets who were before you. Amen. Amen. Uh, I just want to reflect on this very briefly on three aspects of the Sermon on the Mount. And the first one is the impact that the Sermon on the Mount has had. I want you to think for a moment, uh, who are the great lights of the 20th century? And if you were to name, say, five of the best, the, the most prominent people in the 20th century, I'm sure that there's a fair chance that two of them would come up who were greatly influenced by the Beatitudes. And one of them wasn't even a Christian. His name was Gandhi. And Gandhi was so impressed by what the Beatitudes, what these, uh, this reading said, that he took it as his mantra for finding independence for all of India. Isn't it amazing? And yet, and Gandhi once said that the Christian faith appealed so much to him that he, be, he could become a Christian except for one thing and that was that Christians didn't live by their faith. Isn't that a sad indictment on, on, on the Christian people that he was impressed by the faith but it was the Christians that put him on. And following Gandhi there was another man who modelled a lot of his activities, political activities on, um, on Gandhi and that was Martin Luther King. And of course, King also followed a very pacifist way of doing things. And as you look at these Beatitudes, they are very much a framework for the way the world should be. And as I said, you know, that's the first thing I want to look at is, is the political aspect of these Beatitudes because they are so different to the way the world thinks. If you have a look at them, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does the world say? Blessed are you who know everything. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are you, says the world, if you are comfortable and well fed. Blessed are the meek. Might is right, says the world. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. If you <clears throat> don't give a sucker an even break, the world says. Blessed are the merciful. Well, how much mercy is being shown in war-torn parts of the world today? Blessed are the pure in heart. The world says if you can get away with it, good on you. Blessed are the peacemakers. And the world has not been at peace ever since Jesus said these words. Blessed are those who are persecuted. It's interesting, isn't it? The last one is mentioned twice. Blessed are those who are persecuted. In a world that seeks pleasure, we find that. And so these readings, these sayings here, are completely the opposite to what the world says. So we're looking at a radical, this is a radical view. The Christian, there is no such thing as a conservative Christian. You cannot be a conservative Christian. We are called to, as subversives to turn over a world order. And I used to vote once on a political line, but I don't anymore. I don't vote for a party. I look at the person who is the leader and I look at these, these criteria and I think, which one matches those criteria the more. And that's the person that I vote for. 
The second thing I want to look at and is, is um, just these Beatitudes can sometimes be taken as a unity and, um, and they are in some ways a Christian journey. And if you have a look, blessed are the poor in spirit, it's the first one. Isn't it amazing how many times people in the scriptures who come into an encounter with Jesus find themselves realising that they are poor in spirit. Moses said, I, couldn't, I can't speak. Isaiah said, go away from me for I am a, you know, a sinner and I've seen God face to face. Peter also got down on his knees and said, go away Jesus, I am a sinful man. Jeremiah said, I'm too young. And I love Job because Job, who complains to God, has God talked to him face to face and realised that the gap between who he is and who God is is enormous. And it's, when, and it's that first encounter with Christ that we become aware of who we are in spirit in relation to who God is. And when we go through that step, there can be a mourning, a mourning for the fact that the life we have been leading has not been honouring God. So there's the encounter with God and knowing who God is and then realising who we are. So you've got those two things. Blessed are the poor in spirit and those that mourn. And when we go through that journey, two things happen to us. One thing happens inside us. We find that our nature changes. Blessed are the meek. All of a sudden our own arrogance isn't so important anymore. We find ourselves changing in our manner. I remember uh, when I was... Uh, talking to a man in prison once, he said he didn't want to talk to me because I was pushing religion. And I said, no, I'm not. Anyway, we got to form a friendship. And then he asked me for a Bible. And so the journey went for a while. And one day he said to me, Russ, I don't know what's happened to me. When people upset me, I punch them in the face. He said, now I'll walk away. I'm changing. But the second thing that happens is not just what happens inside us, we look around and see what happens around us and we realise that the world is not a good place. And so we hunger and thirst for righteousness. So we have the, the realisation of who God is, the realisation of who we are and the changes within and without. And then there's the action to follow the changes. We become merciful. We become pure in our heart. And we become peacemakers. And so you can see that following in your journey. But if you're going to live that Christian life, don't think people are going to like you. <laughs> because when you're looked on as a peacemaker, people see you as being on one side or the other. People become suspicious. When you want to be pure in heart, people will call you a bowser. When you're merciful, people see you as weak. And so you will be persecuted. Jesus said, don't be surprised. It will happen. The third thing I wanted to do was just to concentrate on a couple of these, um, <clears throat> these here. The first two. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What does poor in spirit mean? Can I give you an example, uh, an illustration? Imagine I have a blackboard here in front of me. You don't have to see my face, there's the blackboard. And on one blackboard I draw Jack, and on the other side I draw Jill. And there they are on the blackboard. And through the blackboard comes the hand of God. And so Jack looks at the hand and he sees the hand from his side and Jill looks at the hand from her side. And they see different things. They see different things because they are two-dimensional figures trying to see a three-dimensional hand. And that's what God is like. We are finite-dimensional, three-dimensional creatures trying to understand an infinite God. And so we can do one of two things. Jack can say, this is what God is like. I've seen him and I know what God is like. And Jill can say, no, this is what I see as God. But if Jack is poor in spirit, he will say, this is what God appears to for me. What do you see God as, Jill? And so by being poor in spirit, we are open to questioning each other and asking about it. I remember reading a book by Bishop Spong. Some of you may know of him. He's a very, very liberal man who doesn't believe in the resurrection and, uh, and has a very uh, radical, right, right, left-wing theology. 
And I remember reading one of his books and I found the hairs on the end of my nose started to bristle and I got cranky. And all of a sudden I stopped and I thought, why am I so upset? Am I so insecure in my belief that someone who thinks differently to me is a threat? Because if I see my aspect of God, I can look at the way another person sees them. I may not agree with them, but it's the only way I can expand my understanding of who God is. So I'm going to invite you to uh, just share with each other on how those Beatitudes speak to you on those three uh, criteria. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that you are a God who, whose word is, is infinite. And 2,000 years after Jesus said these words, we find that people still rely on them as a basis of understanding or a help to understanding who you are. Lord, may we in our poverty find richness in your grace. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thanks, mate. That's it. That's it. Get back up there. It's not long enough. Hey? It's not long enough.